Assalamu alaikum, I am Dr. Noreen Akmal. I am working as Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Fatma Jinnah Medical University, Lahore. Hospital affiliated with this university is Sir Gangaram Hospital. This hospital has a very busy obstetric department and we are catering for approximately 25 to 26,000 deliveries per year. Over the past few decades, it has been observed that the rate of cesarean section is increasing at a very high rate. At, at the same time, the art of operative vaginal delivery is declining. Now less and less, few and few obstetricians, they are using operative vaginal delivery. Why is it so? The reason for this, that one of the reasons is that the cesarean section has become now much a safer procedure and more and more obstetricians are preferring if anything goes wrong or of vaginal delivery is not being achieved. The second reason may be the fear of litigation. And the third and the most important reason is that the young generation of the obstetrician is not adequately trained in the use of operative vaginal delivery and the use of these instruments. The purpose of these videos, it will be uh, two videos in the part one. We are, because we use two instruments, that is forceps and the vacuum. The part one of this video will deal with the use of the forceps delivery and in the part two, we will discuss the use of the Ventus delivery. Regarding the indications for the forceps delivery, and I would like to remind you here because that in this video, I am just going to focus on the outlet forceps delivery. The mid cavity and the rotational forceps deliveries, they will not be discussed in this video. So we are just going to focus on the outlet forceps delivery. What are the indications for these forceps delivery? They can be divided into maternal indication and the fetal indications. The maternal indication, the most common indication is the prolonged second stage of labor. But we should keep in mind that now the duration for the second stage of labor for a nulliparous woman with the use of epidural is up to four hours. And without the use of epidural analgesia in a nulliparous woman, we should wait up to three hours. That is the duration of the second stage of labor. For a multiparous woman with the use of epidural analgesia, the duration of the second stage is up to three hours. And without epidural analgesia, it is up to two hours. And we can wait for these this time duration if the fetal heart rate remains normal. So this is the one indication, prolonged second stage of labor. Other indication, maternal exhaustion. If the mother is exhausted, then we must help the mother and expedite the delivery. And the third indication, which is with for the use of forceps, is if the mother is suffering from some medical disorders in which we don't want the mother to use the Valsalva maneuver, that is mother is suffering from cardiovascular, respiratory or intracranial pathology, we can use the forceps to shorten the second stage of the labor. And the fetal indication, is the fetal distress. In order to save the baby, we want to expedite the delivery of the baby if the fetal is in distress. So these are the indications for the use of the forceps delivery. Regarding the prerequisites for the outlet forceps delivery, it should be kept in mind that it should they should be applied to a vertex presentation. The vertex should be at the level of the outlet. That means that the vertex should be visible through the intraitus even in between the uterine contractions. The sagittal suture should be in the midline that is in the anteroposterior diameter of the outlet. Cervix should be fully dilated. Bladder should be empty, uterus must be contracting, that means there should be adequate contractions and if the contractions are not adequate, you should consider the use of oxytocin. And another important thing is that if the procedure fails and the uh, operator is not able to deliver the baby, th then the procedure should be abandoned and we should have a backup plan. That means that if the operative vaginal delivery fails, we should have a backup for the caesarean delivery. So these are the prerequisites for the outlet forceps delivery. Before demonstrating the actual technique of the application of the forceps, I would like to describe the anatomy of the forceps. The forceps consist of two branches, right and the left, they are known. So what are the different parts of this forceps? This is the handle of the forceps and this is the lock of the forceps like this. This is lock. Then comes the shank. This is the shank of the forceps and this whole thing is the blade. 
the blade has fenestration in its sides and the distal part of the blade is known as the toe of the blade and the proximal part is known as the heel of the blade so the end then comes the curves there is always a confusion among the students regarding the cephalic curve and the pelvic curve so this inside of the blades this one this concavity this is the cephalic curve because it is going to accommodate the convexity of the fetal head and this curve this is the pelvic curve and this curve is going to follow the curve of the birth canal by we are, when we are extracting the baby by the use of forceps so i am going to repeat again these are the handle this is the lock these are the shanks these are the blades toe of the blade heel of the blade cephalic curve and the pelvic curve now i'm going to demonstrate the actual technique of application of the forceps and i'm going to follow the mnemonic from a to j this mnemonic will help us so that we do not miss any step in the application of the safe forceps delivery so a a related to a uh, stands for address the patient that means you have to tell the patient that you are going to apply the forceps there should be adequate analgesia either local perineal infiltration or regional block if it is already given and the third a is ask for help because now you are going to do a instrumental delivery you need help there must be somebody to help you and there must be some person available to assist in the resuscitation of the baby then we come to the b bladder must be empty before the forceps are applied so we should make sure that the bladder is empty and you must always have a backup plan that if the forceps delivery fails then what you are going to do you must have a backup for cesarean delivery now we come to the c c is for you should do a pelvic examination and you should make sure that the cervix is fully dilated full dilatation means that the cervix should not be palpable when you do a vaginal examination so the cervix and the vagina and the uterus they become one continuous canal and the uterus must be contracting that means there should be adequate contractions if the contractions are not adequate then you should use oxytocin to increase the strength and duration of the contractions and then comes the d d means we have to determine the position position means that the vertex it should be a vertex presentation the vertex should be at the level of the outlet as i have already told you that we are focusing on the outlet forceps delivery so vertex should be at the level of the outlet and the sagittal suture should be in the midline in the antero posterior diameter of the outlet and while considering d keep in mind always dystocia because you might come across shoulder dystocia and you must be prepared to deal with this emergency if shoulder dystocia occurs after the delivery of the head now we comes to the e e means i should check whether the my equipment is ready equipment is the forceps as well as the equipment for the neonatal resuscitation and equip forceps before applying the forceps that means once i have checked that my equipment is ready now i am going to apply the forceps actually and before applying the forceps on the patient i am going to articulate the forceps as i am going to apply on the real patient so i will hold i will hold the forceps i will lock them i will make sure that the blades are adequately locked and they are of the same size sometimes it happens that the two forceps they are of different sizes and it becomes dangerous for the patient if you apply those forceps to the mother so once i have checked now comes the real application of the forceps the forceps have a right and the left blade so first of all i am going to hold the left blade of the forceps in my left hand just like a pen and then this forceps will be the two fingers of the my my right hand will be applied on the posterolateral aspect of the vagina and i am this forceps will be parallel to the right inguinal ligament of the mother and i am going to apply the forceps like this the important point here is that the force should not be applied with my this hand but the thumb of my right hand is going to direct the to apply pressure on the toe of the blade and will direct the forceps now i will ask my assistant to hold the forceps 
Now I am going to hold right blade of the forceps in my right hand and I am going to apply it like this. It will be parallel to the left inguinal ligament of the mother. Two fingers of my right hand are going to protect the vagina and I am going to just like I applied this, I am going to apply the forceps and the thumb of my left hand is going to apply not this hand but the thumb of the right hand is going to apply pressure and the forceps will be directed and I am going to lock the forceps. Now the forceps have been locked but before applying the traction I have to check for the position for safety are my forceps safely applied and you must remember that for the safe application of the forceps the posterior fontanelle should be one centimeter above the superior surface of the above the surface of the above the plane of the shank it should be in the midline and the lambdoid suture should be equidistance from the upper surface of both the blades and the fenestration of the blade should not allow more than a tip of the finger and I can demonstrate this position for safety on a different model as you can see here like this the forceps have been applied to the fetal head and this is the posterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle is in the midline it is one centimeter above the surface of the plane and it is in the center the lambdoid suture is equidistance from the superior surface of both the blades and the fenestration is not admitting more than tip of my finger so this is the position for safety or the safe application of the outlet forceps once i have confirmed that the forceps have been applied safely then i am going to apply traction so for the traction you should keep in mind that the traction will be applied with mid right hand and it should be applied with my flexed elbow not with the extended elbow so i am going to apply traction and traction should be applied only during a uterine contraction when the uterus is contracting when the uterus is going to contract i am going to apply traction in a downward and forward direction like this and now i am going to assess if there is need for episiotomy this is the time to give the episiotomy so it is not mandatory that every outlet for self delivery should be uh, uh, associated with a episiotomy if you think that the episiotomy is required then you should give the episiotomy so i am going and another thing that is the Paget's maneuver. With my left hand, I am going to apply traction in a backward direction with this hand and I am going to apply traction with this and now I am going to deliver the baby like this. Once the jaw is visible, then I am going to remove the forceps and they will be removed in the reverse order like this and then I am going to remove this blade and after this I am going to deliver the baby like this and the baby will be handed over to the pediatrician and the pediatrician is going to look after the baby and after the delivery of the placenta I am going to examine the mother for any perineal, vaginal or cervical lacerations and I am going to observe the patient for the PPH and I am going to explain the procedure and document all the details of the procedure on the papers. Once the delivery of the baby is complete, baby is delivered, the baby should be handed over to the pediatrician so that the baby should be examined for any trauma and there should be a detailed examination of the mother and the perineum, vagina and the cervix should be inspected for any tear or lacerations and if there are any tear or lacerations and they require repair they should be immediately repaired and the patient should be washed for the postpartum hemorrhage because the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage is higher in patients who have operative vaginal delivery. Once the procedure is complete Details of the procedure should be documented on the papers and the procedure and the outcome should be explained to the mother and any questions from the mother should be answered.